So all these people just showed up. Welcome to the UNCG campus. My name is Sterling Vanderwerker. I will be moderating the debate answering the question, does the Christian God exist? This debate is sponsored by the UNC atheists, agnostics, and skeptics who have invited Shepherds Fellowship Sovereign Grace Baptist Church to debate the question. We have just uh, 30 seconds for each side to make some announcements concerning their organizations. So, Mr. Rob Eldridge, go ahead. Hey, I'm Robert Eldridge. I'm president of the UNC Atheist, Agnostics, and Skeptics. Um, we have meetings every Friday night from 7 to 9 p.m. Usually they're in the EUC, uh, Phillips, in the Phillips room in the EUC. One thing to keep in mind though is we don't have a meeting next Friday night or tomorrow night because of Labor Day on Monday. And our next meeting on September 10th will be in the Dogwood room if anyone's interested in coming out. Our next event, yeah, and it's all on here. Our next event is going to be um, Michael Lackey. He's a, a professor from the University of Minnesota at Morris. He's going to be speaking on the making of Hitler and the Nazis, a tale of modern secularism or, or Christian idealism. So that promises to be uh, uh, interesting, at the least. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pastor Dustin, you have an opportunity for an announcement? I'm the pastor, one of the pastors of Shepherd's Fellowship of Greensboro Baptist Church. Uh, some of you who have seen me on campus doing open air preaching are probably familiar with my voice. Um, I'm going to have to yell at you again tonight. We don't have microphones, but if you want to check us out on the web, go to graceinthetriad.com or graceinthetriad.blogspot.com. Thank you. First, a few safety yeah, instructions. My website is the one up here, proof that God exists. Check it out. <laughs> They're making their own introductions. Uh, first, a few safety instructions. Obviously, there's concern uh, with this many people in the room. We are not counting because it's posted for 49 people. <laughs> okay, please. We have a capacity crowd in attendance. It will be very difficult to hear. I'm probably the loudest of the speakers. So, please remain seated until the break midway through the debate. If you need to use the facilities, Will everyone around them please accommodate them? There are obvious consequences. <laughs> please silence all cell phones now. I'll take about 10 seconds so that you might be able to uh, grab your cell phone. You may silence them, please. If you carry a pager, then you are out of date. Please silence those. <laughs> and for personal digital assistants or robots, please silence those. Third, the vast majority of you received a handout. <clears throat> there are rules of conduct for the audience. Please, in order for the question to be answered by the debaters, it is essential that the audience remain quiet until the conclusion of the debate. This provides no distractions to either the affirmative or to the negative and permits the entire audience to concentrate on the most important thing. That is their determination on who prevails in the question. The debaters respect, uh, request respectful conduct and the moderator will stop the debate in order to maintain a collegiate air of respect and discipline. We will permit no profanity or outburst, please, and we will stop the debate until such time you have been removed from the room. Fourth, you've been supplied with a three by five index card for questions which will be collected at the break. If you will bring those up here, this uh, uh, trash can will not be used as a trash can. It will be a depository for your questions. Please write clearly. It's important that your question be limited to reading less than 30 seconds. Fourth, we've supplied you with an information sheet containing the schedule and rules and the curriculum vitae for each participant. As a result, I will not make introductions other than the debater's first and last names. Please open your program now, or turn it over if it's face down. And I as I introduce to you the members of the UNCG Atheists, Agnostics, and Skeptics, who will answer the questions in the negative. This is Mr. Joshua Deaton and Mr. Philip Drum. Hello. And now, answering the question in the positive, the debaters from Shepherd's Fellowship, Sovereign Grace Baptist Church. Pastor Dustin Seegers and Mr. Cy Tenbergenkate. 
If you are able, please be seated and gentlemen prepare to answer the following question in the affirmative. Does the Christian God exist? You may begin. Well, good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you. We want to thank the UNCG atheists, agnostics, and skeptics for inviting us to participate in this most important debate. Tonight we'll begin our presentation by noting that we'll not be defending a generic theism, but instead we'll be defending Christian theism as solely grounded in Scripture. So we're not interested in debating gods we don't believe in. We don't believe in the flying spaghetti monster. We don't believe in the invisible pink unicorn. And we'll stand right beside you to laugh, laugh and critique them as well. We're going to use a Christ-centered method that defends the view that God is the ultimate authority over all aspects of life, what is known as a worldview apologetic. Let's get into some definitions. Since our opponents tonight are naturalists, it'll be important to define what that is. Naturalism denies that there are any spiritual or supernatural realities. There are, that is, no purely mental substances and there are no supernatural realities transcended to the world, or at least we have no sound grounds for believing that there are such realities, or perhaps even for believing that there could be such realities. It is the view that anything that exists is ultimately made up of physical components. Here's a lowdown on what that means. Nature is all there is. There are no spiritual realms. There's no immaterial entities or realities. Carl Sagan probably summed it up best when he said, the cosmos is all there is, all there ever was, and all there ever will be. Now, it's important to note tonight that this debate is not about facts, but instead about one's interpretation of the facts. Any interpretation of any fact or experience is informed by one's assumptions about reality, what we call presuppositions. These are those rock-bottom foundational beliefs that all people have that are not testable in a science lab and aren't observed in nature. These presuppositions form the foundation of a person's worldview, that being defined as a network of presuppositions through which every aspect of man's knowledge and experience is interpreted and interrelated. People's presuppositions determine how they interpret and evaluate every experience and which ideas they will and will not accept as part of their overall view of reality. The following quote from atheist Richard Lewontin demonstrates the power of presuppositions. Quote, Materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Now why would an atheist say that? Well, let's read the rest of the quote to get some more context. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Here's a summary of what that guy said. Even if God's the answer, we're not going to allow it. Now, as Christians, we demonstrate that things like knowledge and proof make sense in the Christian worldview given our presuppositions, but they don't make sense in the naturalist worldview given theirs. Regarding faith, we take the view that biblical faith is not a blind leap into an irrational void, nor is it opposed to reason. It doesn't take over where reason leaves off, but instead faith in God is the foundation of all reasoning. Hebrews 11.1 1 defines Christian faith as being sure of what we hope for, being convinced of what we do not see. This doesn't apply to just Christian reasoning, but atheistic reasoning has its own kind of faith too, since everyone begins with presuppositions that are not testable through the procedures of natural science. Since God is ultimately the foundation of all knowledge, and unbelievers actually do know things, it follows that they actually do know God in some sense, but are suppressing the truth about Him. Romans chapter 1 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they didn't honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. And so the problem, according to Romans 1, is not that mankind doesn't have enough evidence for the existence of God. The problem is because of sin, he suppresses the knowledge of God that he already has hardwired within him and goes after idols based upon his own ultimate authority, which is himself. G.K. Chesterton said it well when he said this, When man ceases to worship God, he doesn't worship nothing. He worships anything. 
The Christian's ultimate authority, however, is the Word of God, which teaches that all knowledge is ultimately grounded in God. Colossians 2, verse 3. However, the atheist says that all knowledge is gained through reason and sense perception, which supposedly isn't dependent on God and renders the idea of God unnecessary by law of parsimony. They believe they're their own ultimate authority. They're autonomous, a law unto themselves. This has been clearly stated on the UNCG Atheist, Agnostics, and Skeptics website where they state, man has a right to live by his own law. Now given that statement, I wonder what rational objection our opponents could produce had we chosen to win this debate by shooting them. Now, of course the atheist doesn't agree that all knowledge comes from God and will create persuasive arguments to justify their ability to know things apart from God, hence the futile speculations of Romans chapter 1. That's why after Paul says that all knowledge is hidden in Christ, he's go, he goes on to say in verse 4 of Colossians 2, I say this so that no one will delude you through persuasive argument. In verse 8 of the same chapter he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. When the atheists debate us, they'll want us to take a neutral position when looking at evidence and arguments. They'll want us in principle to give up Christian theism to defend Christian theism. The problem is no one is neutral when it comes to dealing with issues of ultimacy. As the quote I read earlier illustrated, the atheist isn't neutral at all and neither are we. Thus we'll not give up our position that God's the authority because if you assume the unbeliever's standards of authority rather than the authority of Scripture, you lose before you start. It's like getting on the unbeliever's airplane. It doesn't matter what you talk about, you're going to the unbeliever's destination. Let me give you an example. Let's say you've appealed to the ultimate authority of the atheist, his senses and reasoning, and you've used historical evidence to demonstrate with a high degree of probability that Jesus rose from the dead. The atheist could easily say, wow, strange things happen in the world, and someday we'll have a naturalistic explanation as to why a dead body came back to life. Meanwhile, turn it into the National Enquirer magazine. You see, you showed that Jesus rose from the dead, but there was no reason for the atheist to give up his ultimate authority. It's worse than that, though. Let's say the person says, okay, you've met my standard of proof and I want to become a Christian. The problem is his ultimate authority is still not changed. He's being the judge over whether or not God exists based on his standard of reasoning rather than submitting his reasoning to Christ as the Lord of his reasoning. Let's say next week he reads a book by Richard Dawkins and now the balance of evidence seems to sway the other way. Does he then cease becoming a Christian? 1 John chapter 2, verse 19 says that if you left the faith, you were never really in it to begin with, thus proving that Christ was never really the Lord of your reasoning. That's why the true believer's reasoning is founded on the Word of God. We even believe things that we can never personally experience and have never personally experienced, namely that a man rose from the dead. But when there are things that we don't understand, we're to trust God and submit our reasoning to Him because He's the foundation of our reasoning. Proverbs chapter 3 says it well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. And so our role tonight will be able to press the antithesis between our two respective worldviews. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sai Tim Rimkate, and I came down to this debate all the way from Canada. Now this may surprise you, but I didn't come here tonight to win this debate. I'm also not here to defend the freaks that call themselves Christians. <laughs> I came here because our opponents, and perhaps many of you, are choosing hell over the God that you know exists. And folks, I don't want you to go there. I came here to urge you to repent of your sins and put your trust in Jesus Christ your only hope for escaping the hell that each one of us deserves. Now, a few weeks ago, I debated a fellow on British radio who said that if Christianity was true, he was actually looking forward to going to hell. Now, folks, that man has no idea what he's talking about. Now, I'm not going to stand up here, or sit here, and tell you that the flames of hell written about in the Bible are literal flames, but I, what I will tell you is that those who end up in hell are going to wish that they were. As Sterling mentioned, my website is ProofThatGodExists.org. Now you may have been excited at the prospect of someone finally coming here to prove that God exists to you. 
but I'm going to disappoint you. I'm not going to prove that God exists to you tonight. Folks, that's the bad news. The good news is, they are. With every objection they make to Christianity, they're going to be proving that God exists. You see, our objective here tonight is not to give evidence to those of you who have put God on trial, but to expose the fact that everyone here already knows that God exists. You see, folks, it's our position that you can't make sense of things like knowledge, truth, logic, science, and morality apart from the God of Christianity. Everyone here tonight makes assumptions in those areas, but none of them can be justified apart from God. Let me try and explain why. We'll start with knowledge. If our opponents are intellectually honest, and I hope that they are, they'll be forced to admit that an all-knowing, all-powerful God could reveal things to us such that we can know them for certain. You see, knowledge makes sense in the Christian worldview, but it does not make sense in any atheistic worldview. You see, the atheist do not, does not appeal to revelation from God for knowledge, so what do they appeal to? They appeal to their senses and reasoning. But what's the problem there? If they appeal to their senses, how do they know that their senses are valid? If they appeal to their reasoning, how do they know that their reasoning is valid? Surely all of you can see the vicious circularity of stating, I sense and reason that my senses and reasoning are valid. Yet this is precisely what the atheist is reduced to. Now they may even see the circularity of their position and end up saying, okay, I can't know anything, <coughs> but either can you. To which I ask, if you can't know anything, how can you know what I can know? Tonight, however, our opponents will make knowledge claims. When they do so, they'll be borrowing the concept of knowledge from Christianity and actually be proving that God exists. But what about truth? What is truth to an evolutionist? The best that an evolutionist could hope for is believing this has helped me to survive. If all we are is evolved chemical reactions, how do you get to this is true. As Doug Wilson argued, if we're just advanced chemical reactions debating over which one of us is speaking the truth, we'll be on par with shaking up a bottle of Mountain Dew on this table and a bottle of Dr. Pepper on that table, opening them up and deciding which chemical reaction is producing true fizz and which chemical reaction is producing false fizz. Chemical reactions do not produce truth. For truth, you need God. But Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When our opponents make truth claims, they'll be borrowing the concept of truth from Christianity and actually proving that God exists. So what about logic? Tonight our opponents will make logical objections to the truth of Christianity. They might say, look at all the logical contradictions in the Bible. I'm sure you've all heard of that before. But what are they assuming when they make that objection? They're assuming that there are universal, immaterial, unchanging laws of logic that forbid contradictions. Of course, I believe that there aren't any contradictions in the Bible, and as a Christian, I'll seek to resolve anything that looks contradictory. But how does the atheist account for the universal, immaterial, unchanging law of non-contradiction in a random chance world made only of matter? Christians believe in a God who is universal, who is not made of matter, and who does not change. Logical laws make sense in our worldview. When our opponent makes logical objections to Christianity, they're borrowing the foundation of logic from Christianity and are actually proving that God exists. Well, what about science? All of science is based on the assumption that nature is uniform or that the future is like the past. Would anyone get into a rocket ship if the scientists who built it didn't have a reasonable expectation of what would happen when they pushed the launch button? But on what basis do they expect the future to be like the past? Now the Christian believes in a sovereign God who keeps nature uniform such that we can do science. The thing is, in order to even speak, one must trust that the words they're about to speak mean the same things they did five seconds ago. Now if our opponents open their mouths to speak tonight, they'll be assuming that the future is like the past. But on what basis does the atheist assume that the future will be like the past? How does the atheist know anything about the future? When our opponents make scientific objections, or when they even speak, they're borrowing the foundations of the uniformity of nature from our worldview, and are actually proving that God exists. Now what about morality? Tonight you may hear our opponents say that there's too much evil in this world for an all-good God to exist. But my question is this. 
if there is no God, by what absolute standard do you call anything evil? You see, the evil in this world is not a logical objection to Christianity, who has an absolute standard of morality, but it's a logical objection for the atheist who does not. The Christian says that morality is derived from the nature of God. When our opponents raise moral objections to Christianity, they're borrowing the absolute standard of morality from our worldview and actually proving that God exists. Now, they might say that they don't need God for their moral standard. Man has the right to live by his own law. That's what it says on their website. But says who? What obliges anyone to live by that standard? Do our atheist friends even live by their own standard? Well, let's see. If man has the right to live by his own law, doesn't the democratically elected mayor of this city have the right to live by his own law and institute prayer and council meetings? Well, apparently not. Our atheist friends regularly protest the mayor's right to live by his own law, and they violate their own standard. The question becomes, though, what obliges advanced bags of primordial slime, us, to live by any law? The fact is, folks, there could be no moral obligations of any kind without God. When they argue that there are, they're proving that God exists. And that's time. What I want you all to do here tonight is listen carefully to our opponent's objections to Christianity. When they make their objections, look at what they're standing on. This evening, our opponent, opponents will make knowledge claims, truth claims, logical claims, and scientific claims, and moral claims. In doing so, they'll be proving that God exists. What if they decide not to offer defense of the worldview tonight? Well, folks, they came here to argue logically, even if they don't utter a single word, just by showing up they lost. All right, now for you. All right, hi, my name is uh, Philip Drum. Tonight I'm going to be uh, starting off the argument for uh, our side of the position. Uh, we're on the side of the debate that believes the Christian God doesn't exist. Um, we're going to get into presupposition a little later, but for right now we're going to base the arguments on um, how we see the Christian Bible as false and a few other claims. Uh, these guys say that uh, to understand the world, you have to accept that there's a Christian God, but they don't give a reason or an explanation for this. So we have uh, three basic reasons to why that there is no Christian God. The first reason is that the Bible is false. The second reason is that there's no proof that a person named Jesus ever existed in the world. And the third is there was a never an Adam and Eve in the world. All right, so the first one, the Bible is false. The Torah... The Gospels, the Psalms of the Bible have never reached us, the true versions of these. What we have today is a copy of a copy of a mistranslation of a copy of a copy of something that was an account by someone who wasn't an eyewitness to the events. If you want to compare this to any other book, uh, I don't know if anybody here is UNCG students, but I had a class uh, a few semesters ago that was uh, Roman Civilization. The class uh, made a requirement that you read the book Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Uh, the book said, uh, uh, historians can prove the book was written uh, by a man named Marcus Aurelius between the years of 170 and 180 when he was on campaign. And it's written in the same verse and message throughout. If you read the whole thing, it is stylistically the same book. And the Bible suffers from drastic changes from testament to testament. The God of the Old Testament is not the same God of the New Testament. One is wrathful, vengeful, killing people, destroying civilizations. The other one is merciful. Uh, kind, forgiving. These aren't the same person. There are also plenty of errors in the Bible that prove that it's false. For instance, there are mistakes in nature. The Bible says the earth is flat. The Bible says the earth is stationary and is on pillars. The Bible says the moon produces light. The Bible says uh, things about the water cycle that aren't true. The story of the Tower of Babel is completely false. The flood uh, other prophecies that have been proven false. The destruction of Damascus that's prophesied in Daniel. The Nile River will dry up. Well, maybe it will eventually with climate change, but, you know, that's, uh, that's up for debate. Um, the promises that the unclean will never enter Jerusalem again, basically saying that uncircumcised men will never enter Jerusalem, but that happens all the time nowadays because Jerusalem's uh, the center for three religions. Uh, promises that, e that uh, God will make Egypt inhabitable for 40 years. This has never happened. Other things, the time and place of events. If you read the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, they give two different uh, times for Jesus' birth. One is in 4 BCE, and the other is in uh, 6 CE, based on the events that happened during the time. If there is a true Savior in the world, then how can uh, we as logical people think about things and not understand that there are two different times for Him being born? It just doesn't make sense. Also, in Genesis, it gives two different orders of creation. If anyone's ever read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, they give different orders of how the Bible or how God created uh, the, the world. It just doesn't meld with how a, a creator would have it work. 
The next claim is that Jesus Christ uh, is not a real person. All accounts from Jesus derive from hearsay accounts. There's no actual person that was an eyewitness to Jesus being alive. The only uh, things that we have are the Gospels, and they're just, just written by people we don't know who they were written by. Uh, in Matthews, it mentions that uh, Jesus had a great multitude of followers, but no one ever bothers to write down that he exists as a person. Uh, a guy named Johnny Rosenberg wrote a book called The Christ, A Critical Review and Analysis of the Evidence of His Existence. It lists the following writers who within a century or a century after that Jesus uh, was supposed to live. And there's a list of about 50 of these guys. I'm going to name off some of them. Josephus, Philo Josephus, uh, Seneca, Pliny the Elder, Arian, Platonius, Dion, uh, Pertonius, Suetonius, Juval, Meredith, Perseus. There are a lot more of these. I'm not going to name them off because I'm not very good at Greek or, uh, or, or, you know, or speaking uh, Latin. But regardless... None of these guys mentioned that Jesus actually lived as a person. And they were people around the area and in the time. And if Jesus actually did have followers, if he was actually a real person, then he would have existed in this way that people could have known that he was there. The last point that I'm going to make tonight uh, before I turn it over to uh, my partner Josh is that there was no Adam and Eve. Evolution uh, is the biological, uh, biological evolution is that any genetic change in population is inherited over generations. Anyone who's taken a, a basic biology course is going to know that you pass on some traits to your children, some you don't pass on. Some are good, some are bad, and that's how it works. But the evidence for evolution is just overwhelming. There are seven completely different lines of evidence that prove that evolution exists. And that these ideas prove that there was never an Adam or an Eve, that these stories in the Bible are completely false. There are fossils, biogeography, vestigility, uh, geological succession, embryogeology, and genetics. And these all prove that there was nothing that ever existed like a person named Adam and Eve. If this happened, there's no such thing as original sin. So the Bible, the basic first story of the Bible that Adam and Eve sinned on, in, the, in, the, in Genesis 2, not the first Genesis because that's a different story, that, that this never happened. So I would just like for everybody to read, to, to learn these facts, and to just understand that, I mean... You can't make a claim that a Christian God exists with no proof. And that's what these guys are doing. Uh, turn it over to Josh. Uh, I graduated high school in North Carolina in the year 2000. Uh, in my later high school years, I experienced a typical teenage existential crisis. I often felt as if I had nothing to live for. My parents were experiencing difficulties with their marriage. I experienced a stereotypically dramatic teenage breakup. And it was at that <laughs> moment in my life uh, that I attended a Christian music festival where I heard someone give an impassioned speech about cultivating depth and meaning in life beyond the consumerism of the American dream and keeping up with the Joneses. The speech impacted me in a deeply emotional way and I interpreted this very powerful moment for me in terms of the religious tradition that I was accustomed to, Christianity. That moment led to a radical transformation of my life. I became passionate about my new faith. I zealously preached about this faith in school and I even tried to become a Christian minister. I worked at a church for a couple years teaching New Testament courses. Attempts to persuade non-believers to avoid an eternity in hell, as well as the emphasis on the poor and oppressed that I found in the Gospels, helped cultivate within me compassion and empathy on a global scale. And because I believed that the Bible was inspired by my God as the authoritative key to understanding Him and His purposes, I began to daily study its contents with great eagerness. So my former experience as a Christian contributed positive aspects to my personal development that I will forever treasure. But it was precisely these positive qualities that were developed in my life that led me to ultimately conclude that the Christian God most likely does not exist. That's not a very absolute statement, so it may not you know, jive with some of you, but whatever. My, life, my love of study and countless hours spent poring over the Bible eventually led me to the conclusion that the Bible is full of all sorts of errors and contradictions, and thus cannot provide a clear and reliable guide to understanding who God is or what God wants. And my love for my neighbors, my fellow sentient beings, combined with the very real and overwhelming problem of suffering, led me to conclude that an all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly good God almost certainly does not exist. So let me first address why I came to dismiss this Christian scriptures as being a reliable witness to the existence of God. 
What sort of book would one expect the Bible to be if it were not divinely inspired? We would rightfully expect a collection of writings that serve as a sort of cultural artifact, reflecting the values and critical limitations of its time. We would expect a pre-scientific understanding of nature and the universe, which Phil addressed briefly. Had the creator of the universe guided the biblical authors, we might conversely expect brilliant insight into the mechanics of creation. Unfortunately, that's lacking. If the Bible were not divinely inspired, we would probably expect stories and myths that were adapted and evolved from the myths of the contemporary culture, which we find in the Bible. Without divine guidance, we would not expect the ancient authors to be able to provide wholly accurate historical information, God's not guiding them, or to be completely free from inconsistencies or contradictions. And if the stories of the Christian God are no more historical than other testimonies of interaction with deities from the same era, then we would probably expect an understanding of morality in the Bible that corresponds with the values of antiquity and is largely irrelevant and outdated for us moderns. <clears throat> and what I would expect to find if the Bible was not inspired by God is exactly what I found the more familiar I became with its text. For example, superstitions are as prevalent in Christian scripture as they were among the pagan contemporaries of the biblical authors. Maybe that's not a big deal to you, that's a big deal to me. For example, we are told of a universal flood. Geologically, we know this doesn't happen, but it's a common myth in antiquity. Diseases and mental illness caused by demons. A talking snake, a talking donkey, humans living for hundreds of years, a woman being turned into a pillar of salt, the sun standing still in the sky, an axe head floating on water, a shard standing down on one specific tiny building, the spontaneous acquisition of foreign languages, storms being caused by sin, long hair as the source of a, an individual's superhuman strength, and on and on. These stories would be, re, be received very skeptically, even by my opponents here tonight, if someone claimed they happened today, regardless of their worldview. We would require some seriously convincing evidence to demonstrate that nature is no longer working in a natural way. Yet the Bible is full of such unbelievable stories, and it seems strange and perhaps a little too convenient that this God would choose to perform his magic before the scientific age that he would perform his magic before the printing press, before photographs, before the internet. It seems strange that he would be so concerned with demonstrating, tangibly demonstrating, his power and authority to an ancient, superstitious, and largely illiterate people, but leave subsequent generations without a means to verify their testimony. For example, the liberation of the Hebrew slaves from Egypt, as told in Exodus, would have decimated Egyptian society, its agriculture, infrastructure, political leadership, manpower, and on and on, and yet we have no archaeological evidence for this mass exodus. The multitude of Egyptian soldiers, soldiers that were supposedly drowned in the Red Sea, we don't find any chariots or armor at the bottom of the Red Sea. There's no archaeological evidence to support the rapid conquest of Canaan by the Israelites. And what about the life of Jesus? Uh, Phil has alluded to some inconsistencies in the Gospels. Uh, in Matthew's Gospel, soon after the birth of Jesus, King Herod ordered the mass slaughter of all children two years old and younger living in and around Bethlehem. And yet no author, Christian or otherwise, from that time gives this account. This would be a huge deal. And I don't think it's fair to just dismiss this. And there's other things. In Luke's Gospel, at the time of Jesus' birth, Caesar Augustus, whose reign we have pretty good records on, supposedly ordered, according to Luke, a census to be taken of all the inhabitants of the Roman Empire and that everyone who had to register had to return to the home of their ancestors. Think of the massive bureaucratic feat that would entail. Never mind how they would even accomplish it. But yet again, no Christian or pagan or contemporary authors reference this. Only Luke. Luke also claims that this census took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. But as New Testament scholar Bart Ehrman points out, if Matthew is right that Jesus was born during Herod's reign, then Luke cannot also be right that it happened when Quirinius was governor of Syria. We know from a range of other historical sources, including the Roman historian Tacitus, the Jewish historian Josephus, and several ancient inscriptions, that Quirinius did not become governor of Syria until 10 years after Herod's death. Maybe that's not a big deal for you either. <clears throat> the Bible also presents a morality that is at best irrelevant to our needs today and at worst threatens the values that most of us hold dear. The God of the Bible ordered a society that makes the Taliban look moderate. <laughs> this God 
commanded, and I can give you the references later, I don't have time, this guy commanded that the death penalty be the consequence for picking up sticks on the Sabbath, for disrespecting one's parents, for simply worshiping another deity. And we don't like the Taliban. This God also instructs his followers that if a man rapes a virgin who is pledged to be married, the rape victim herself must be stoned to death. And I'll give you the reference real quick. Deuteronomy 22, verses 23 and 24. That's disgusting. The barbarism goes on and on, and I've had to cut out a lot of my references. So for me, the Bible is what I would exactly expect from antiquity. It does not provide a reliable guide to what God is like and what his plans are, if indeed a God exists. But the problem of suffering was for me just as important in de deconstructing my faith in the existence of the Christian God. This problem was stated by David Hume in the following way. Is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then he is impotent. Is he able to prevent evil, but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then where does all the evil come from? The God of the Bible is portrayed as frequently intervening in nature and the affairs of humans in order to execute his purposes. This God is said to have miraculously freed the Israelites from slavery, going so far as to kill all the firstborn sons of Egypt in order to do so. And yet he did nothing, nothing for the African Americans who were enslaved in the American South. We had to do something about that. The Red Sea was supposedly supernaturally parted to the, allow the Hebrew slaves safe passage out of Egypt. And yet the waters of the 2004 tsunami were allowed to effortlessly kill a million Indonesians. A quarter of a million. When it suited this God's whims, their God's whims, he provided food from heaven and was able to multiply a basket of bread and fish to feed multitudes. Yet how many people did die, die today from starvation and hunger? The Christian God added 15 years to King Hezekiah's life, but is apparently unmoved by the untimely deaths of all these children with cancers that filled up the cancer wards in our hospitals in every city. It's one minute. The Christian God restored sanity to the tormented King Nebuchadnezzar, but apparently it would not bring this God glory to do the same for those suffering from mental illness today. And as someone who has worked with people with mental illness and developmental disabilities, that's a shame and it's disgusting if this God exists. Jesus and his apostles could apparently heal with a touch, a word, or even their shadows, and yet the AIDS pandemic continues to rack the already poor and suffering in, in Africa today. So perhaps a God or, God or gods do exist. Perhaps. I could be wrong. There could be some gods out there. But due to the unreliability of the Bible, it seems unlikely to me that the Christian God, which is defined by the Bible, exists at all. Ten seconds. And surely a benevolent and all-powerful God does not exist in light of the overwhelming and gratuitous suffering in our world today. Thank you. The first cross-examination in the affirmative is eight minutes. And gentlemen, you have just a few seconds, about 15 seconds, while I change the time here. Okay, and if you'll please stop when I call time. Your time starts now. All right. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Uh, we're going to start with some questions. You can all change. You can answer. Uh, Would it be possible for the Christian God to communicate some things to us in such a way that we could know them for certain? Would that be possible? Uh, as certain as we know anything. So if the Christian God exists, he could reveal things to us such that we could know them for certain. He could result. He could reveal things to us, but he could also. Uh, yeah, no, but that's that's the only question. I'm oh, okay, okay. Possible. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. How how is it possible for you as atheists to know anything for certain? I would I would state that um, I mean you could use the original argument Vigitar ergo sum, but you're going to say that begs the question, right? Right. 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 Well, then uh, I mean Kierkegaard came up with the next argument. Uh, X thinks I am that X. Uh, therefore, I think. Therefore, I am. It takes uh, it takes the uh, the begging the question away from the argument. Would you disagree with that? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. No, I've, I've never heard of Kierkegaard's response to that, so oh, okay. I can't reply to it at that point. Okay. So you can know that you exist. Yeah. Okay. So how do you know you're here? I, I just I just stated it. I mean, right. Should I say it again? Yes, please. Okay. X X thinks I am that X. Right. I, therefore, I think. Therefore, I am. 
it's yeah. it's a it's a version of cogito ergo sum that takes the uh, the begging the question out of the argument. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Do you believe the only way we can know things are through the five senses? Yes. Okay. Do you know that through the five senses? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Can you show me that? Can you show me that proposition? Can you give me a cup of it, a bucket of it? No, I think we're equally locked into presuppositions there. So you're, you're telling me that you can't show me the proposition that you can only know things through the five senses? Do you, my response is kind of a question. But yes, sir. We typically, I think, you called us naturalists at the beginning of this. I think everybody here is naturalist. We, we believe things based on evidence. And sometimes people make extraordinarily, extraordinary claims, and that requires extraordinary evidence. Well, let's, let's just get to the next question then. This might make it a Fair little enough. easier. You say that all things are known through the five senses. How do you know that your senses are valid? And how do you know that your reasoning about your senses is valid? It's I mean, basing, basing my beliefs on the evidence is the most sex successful way for my Right, existence. but do you use your senses and reasoning in order to evaluate that evidence? I would, do you ever try to use anything other than your senses to evaluate evidence? Well, I'm asking you the question. Is, that is what there you anything mean? other than your senses to evaluate evidence? Well, yeah, you can ask those questions when you ask those questions. But that's my response. Is there anything other than your senses to evaluate evidence? Well, I would say that we have a justification for our senses and reasoning. I'm asking what yours is. Your justification is a Bible that's unreliable. Well, we'll get my, to we'll Mine get to that. is the only thing I have is my five senses. If you can okay. give me something else, maybe I'll appeal oh, to No, you. that's fine. If that's what you do, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, I'll read a quote from Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin said this, With me, the hard doubt always arises whether the convictions of a man's mind, which have been developed from the minds of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Why would anyone trust the convictions of a monkey's mind if they were any convictions in such a mind? Now, how can we trust our thoughts if our brains are the product of time, chance, and mere natural processes? I think you're misunderstanding how, uh, how science views reason in this situation. Uh, reason is a tool that humans have used for three, four million years, depending on uh, whose interpretation of anthropological uh, uh, time. Reason is the best tool that we have to evaluate the world that we live in. If reason stops working tomorrow, we'll find another tool. Just as science will find other tools that work for them. You say that there are empirical laws to, to run the natural world, but science doesn't work like that. Science doesn't say that there's a specific law for physics that works for all the time. Well, science said that. That's okay. Um, so you can't answer the question then, right? You just gave me a non-answer. That's the fallacy of a relevant thesis. That's like saying the plane crashes, person walks up, reporter sees the plane crash, and I asked you, how did you get here? And you say, well, I'm here. No, no, I'm not asking you if you're here. We know you're here because you're able to talk. What I'm asking is how did you survive the plane crash? Sure. What I want to know is given time, chance, natural processes in conjunction with evolutionary theory and naturalism, how can you trust the deliverances of your cognitive faculties? Because our cognitive faculties have evolved in such a way to be conducive to our survival because they work. But that's, that doesn't answer the question. That tells me how they were conducive to survival. That doesn't tell me if they cognate for truth. Well, that, that's true. I, I, okay. I think they're... So I you're agree. admitting. No, you're I admitting agree. Darwin's doubt. I, I agree with you that there's no way to, to come to any sort of absolute certainty that we all come from uh, certain presuppositions. I agree with that. I, I think leaping that, from there to the Christian God is absurd. I understand yeah, I that. Well, you're an unbeliever. We, we understand it. But what, what we want to know is if, you're, if your mind is just the, the product of time, chance, and natural processes, and you're fizzing atheistically and I'm fizzing theistically, we're just all fizzing. We're dancing out our DNA and our social conditioning. How much time do I have, moderator? Two and a half. Okay, thank you. If we're all just dancing out our DNA and our social conditioning, how does that code for truth? How is that veridical to the real world? It doesn't code for truth, right? It codes for what works in this life. Okay, uh, let me just get to the next question. We're spending a lot of time there. Does this debate have to follow absolute laws of logic? No. It doesn't? No. Fantastic. For reason, the Bible. Yes, yeah, remember that, folks. <laughs> <laughs> remember that, folks. This debate doesn't have to follow logic. That's going to come into uh, real handy when they start asking us questions. Okay, it doesn't. Two minutes. Okay, do you believe that only matter exists? Are Is you asking if we're materialists? Yes, sir. Based on my five senses, based on my experiences, I've had no experience that would say to me that anything other than what is the material universe exists. Okay. I have no reason to believe, and certainly the Christian scriptures 
do not provide that. Okay. It's an unreliable source to believe in anything beyond the material okay. realm. All right, well then, if that's the case, you're using logic to say that there are all these terrible contradictions in the Bible, therefore we can't trust the Bible. How do you account for immaterial abstract laws that you use to, con to, to form a contradiction in the first place? In other words, uh, Philip, you talked about reasoning earlier. Yeah. Reasoning is based on the, the, the principles of reasoning, which is logic, the principles of logic, the laws of logic, law of non-contradiction. How do you account for an immaterial abstract law in a universe that's only made of particular physical entities? Because uh, the laws of logic uh, cease to function on certain levels. The law of non-contradiction only works to a certain point because it's, it was created by humans. Reason and, and, and the laws of logic work in most situations, but there are situations in which the law of non-contradiction does not work. So the laws of logic are not absolute then? They're definitely not absolute. Okay. I, I said that if earlier. the laws of logic were created by humans, could the universe have both existed and not existed at the same time and in the same way before humans created the law of non-contradiction? <laughs> that's, that's begging the question. No, it's a, it's a question. You're saying that we created logic, so before humans were around, could the universe have both existed and not existed without a law of non-contradiction that we created? Logic is a way of conceptualizing our experience. Well, we reality. created logic, as he said. Yeah. Logic is a way of conceptualizing. Could the universe have both existed and not existed before we created logic? Logic is a way of conceptualizing our experience in this reality. Yeah, but yeah, I understand. I understand you're what you're saying, but logic okay, is sorry. a way of conceptualizing our experiences right. in this reality, and our experiences in this reality do not provide logical inconsistencies. That's why we develop logic. Now, thank you. That's time. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, I'll give you a few minutes to prepare. Okay, I'll have your attention, gentlemen. You may proceed. Eight minutes. Quiet, please. Uh, do you define God as supernatural? Yes. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, and is being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. So God doesn't exist in the natural world? Yes, God does exist in the natural world, but you cannot detect him through empirical means because spirit is immaterial. It's, it does not have extension in space like the laws of logic. How do you define something as supernatural? The, the, the definition of supernatural is not natural. The definition of supernatural was not natural with a, a certain twist to it. So you can't define God as both natural and supernatural. I'm not. What I'm saying is that God... You just did. You just defined a God as supernatural, and then you said he exists in the natural world because he gives you the laws of logic. Hold on just a second. Okay. When, when, when Christians, I appreciate the question, it's a good one. When Christians refer to God being supernatural, Christian theology says that God is both transcendent and imminent. In other words, God is very much other. He's not like us in many, many ways. He's not like the world in many, many ways. There's a creator-creation distinction, like part of that portion that I read from Romans chapter 1. But the scriptures also tell us that God is imminent within the world. In other words, the laws of physics, the laws of logic, the laws of logic are descriptions of the way that God thinks. The laws of physics are descriptions of the way that Christ upholds the, the world by the uh, by the work of his or the word of his power. And so laws of physics are descriptions of how God controls the world. But God is in the world, operating within the world, changing people's lives, but God himself is not natural in the sense that he is part of the creation itself. So. Okay. If we grant your uh, your presuppositions that the existence of the laws of non-contradiction or the laws of logic necessitate that they be grounded in some sort of uh, transmaterial metaphysical reality. If we grant that, why do you suppose that we should go from there to believing in the Christian God and not believing, like you said, in the spaghetti monster or Zeus or a committee of deities or so on? Good question. That's a very good question and uh, it's a misunderstanding of our argument because we don't say because there are immaterial laws, therefore God exists. We're saying that you cannot make sense of those immaterial laws without starting with God. We don't conclude that God exists. We start with the presupposition that He exists, or you can't make sense of these laws. But what so God? Those, those presuppositions could very well also validate the existence of the deist God or the, the philosopher's God, right? Well, let, let me just answer that by saying that we're saying that the presupposition is that the Christian God exists. And we're here debating people that say there is no God. Now, if you want to switch your worldview and become a deist, then I'd be happy to debate you on deism. But you're debating atheism. I don't think you understand atheism. Uh, atheism isn't to say that there is absolute certainty that there is no God. Even Richard Dawkins in The God Delusion doesn't say, I'm absolutely certain that there is no God. I say that there, there perhaps could be a God. I'm asking you, it seems way more likely it's the deist God, even though I don't have evidence for that either. What leads you from this laws of logic presupposition? You said nothing right. that links you from your 
arguments no. to the Christian okay. God. What and I you mean, also yeah. said that the word of God is your ultimate authority. So again, I ask you, why should we believe in the Christian God as opposed yeah. to Zeus, right. as opposed to a committee of deities, as opposed to the, the God of Thomas Paine? That's a great question. And again, we start with the Christian God. Now, if you want to say that a deistic God or no, Zeus... No, why do you start with a Christian God? Because, why? Because if you don't, then your worldview is reduced to absurdity. And I'm saying that if you start with another God... How is your worldview reduced well, okay. to absurdity? Okay, that's fine. And I'll no. give you an example. If you want to start with Zeus, make your argument and I'll show you. You start with Christian. How do you start with Christianity? You start with the Bible, and the, You're not the Bible the is just You're as absurd as Zeus. It. No, I'm saying that if you if you deny that, then your view is reduced to absurdity. And we're going to show that this evening how absurd the view is. And we're saying you have to start there by the impossibility of the contrary. Now, if you want to pause another deity, I'd be happy to debate you on which one do you want to start with. No, so we're not asking know. you to start with another deity. We're asking you how you get from. No deity to the Christian God, and you I refuse to answer. That's the third time you've refused to I, answer. I don't do that. You say, we presuppose that there is a Christian right. God. How so? What does this belief accomplish? How does it work? How are you getting to this assertion that there is a Christian God as opposed to no God, or the God of Zeus? You haven't answered yeah. the question. Well, you're misunderstanding, because we're saying we don't get to the Christian God, we start with him. How do you start with How? Him? You start with him because if you don't, your view is reduced to absurdity. Does everyone see how circular this is? This is not answering anything. There's no question being answered here. Well, he said it. It's absurd. No, no, no. Right. Sorry, please. All right. Bye. <laughs> Keep going, guys. Uh, um, how many types of knowledge do you believe that there are? How many types of what? Of knowledge. How many types of knowledge? Can you kind of describe what you're what you're getting there? Well, I mean, just uh, how do you describe knowledge? Is there is there one type? Is there absolute? Is there more than just absolute knowledge? Okay, you're talking about different types of epistemology. Well, the, there is there are different types of epistemology that people have. There's a secular epistemology, and then there's a theistic epistemology, and there's other types of epistemologies. Our theory of knowledge, how we come to conclusions about things. Has logic changed over time? Well, I, let me answer that first question, if you don't. Well, I would actually prefer the second question. Has laws changed around? You, you, you would answer the first. One. Well, you, you answered it in, in enough time. It has logic changed over time. No. No the logic has not changed. Absolute. They're immaterial, unchangeable so, throughout all places and all times. So the logic you, of hold on. Okay. You, <laughs> thank you. If you deny that, then you're going to end up saying what you said earlier that the universe can exist and not exist at the same time in the same sense, thereby violating the law of non-contradiction. So the logic of Plato is exactly the same as the logic of Schopenhauer or the logic of Aristotle or the no. logic of John Locke? They're all the same no. logic? When I say logic, I'm not referring to the different types of logic that exist amongst human beings. Okay. What I'm talking about is the logic that people have discovered as they live in this world and they live in God's world. Okay. When they live, oh, when they live in God's world, they recognize that it's different. There's a difference between running toward the hungry tiger versus running away from the hungry right. tiger. And people understand that. Now, there are different types of logics amongst secular philosophers. There are some secular philosophers that deny the law of identity and the law of excluded middle. Of course, I don't. I'm a Christian. I believe that the laws of logic hold. I believe the laws of logic are expressions of the way that God thinks. Okay, so if you believe in the laws of logic, how come the laws of logic aren't written anywhere in the Bible? Well, they are. We see. The well, Bible well, where says, are they? Where? Well, like, can you name the verses the Bible, where the law the of non-contradiction is written in, or where the law of? Uh, I mean, yes, Titus chapter one, verse two: God cannot lie. That is not the law of non-contradiction. Yeah, the law of contradiction is the law of the law. You cannot be a and both not a. That is not the law of non-contradiction. God cannot lie is not saying that. That the law of non contradiction well, exists. In scripture, we can derive universal, immaterial, unchanging entities. So it's just like any and, English book you read by Mark Twain, you can not derive it. whatever you want from it. Well, we can do that, and if you want to come to our Bible study, then we'd be happy to see how the Bible <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would love to see that. But the thing is, we're talking about universal, abstract, immaterial entities, and the Bible, the Christian God, comports with that, and we're saying that your worldview does not. Um. I, I have. Uh, we're, we're, yeah, we're good. <laughs> hey, I mean, you proved our points for us. So. We're not. <laughs> okay, we'll save that time for the question and answer period. Thank you, thank gentlemen, you. for giving thank that you. time to the audience. Audience, you can thank them after a bit. Uh, let's see. We have rebuttal in the affirmative. This is a six-minute time. Is there a break first? Uh, uh, no, sir. We are going to break just shortly. Okay, so the affirmative, you can begin now, six minutes. All right, now, you notice that they've done exactly what they said they would do. They said that our worldview is circular and absurd. But why is circular reasoning not allowed in a worldview that cannot account for the laws of logic? See, they, they make a logical objection to Christianity, and then when we press them on logic, they can't account for it. You know, they end up saying, 
illogical things like the universe could both exist and not exist at the same time and in the same way. And if that's the case, they can't even know if they exist now. And that's uh, reduced to absurdity. Now, now, they say stuff about scripture. The thing is, we're not stupid here. The things that look like contradictions, we study the languages and we see how we can uh, come up with resolutions for them. When they say, for instance, you know, the Bible says that the earth is on four pillars. Well, you know what? If I read the Greensboro newspaper today, it's going to say when the sun rises and the sun sets. Does anybody in this room believe that the sun rises and sun sets? But a, a paper in 2010 gives us that information. The thing is, it uses poetic language. We understand that. But the thing is, when they argue that there are, that there are logical problems with the Bible, then they're assuming laws of logic. And a lot of their debate here tonight was talking about moral objections to the Christian God. But by what absolute standard do they make a moral objection to God? And see, this is exactly what Scripture says, that they'll put themselves in the seat of God. They'll assume that they're God so that they can do whatever they want. They can assume what's moral and what's immoral. Now, they're going to say, well, lots of people agree with me. Well, lots of people agree with Hitler. Lots of people agree with Pol Pot, and you see what happened there. If there's no ob objective moral standard, then you cannot make any complaints about what happened in Scripture. And the thing is, folks, I'm going to tell you something here. If you think that those things that happened in Scripture were bad, stick around. Well, we are faced with an embarrassment of riches, and there are many things that were mentioned tonight that I think are very important to talk about. People don't reject God because of a lack of evidence, as we mentioned in our opening statement. The problem is that they suppress the truth and unrighteousness, and they go after a lie. That's essentially what we've heard tonight. The Bible says that the proof that God exists is that without Him you can't prove anything. Paul, quoting one of the Greek poets, says that in Him we live and move and exist. In other words, what we're doing tonight is we're asking which worldview provides what's needed to make reality intelligible in the first place. This is what's known as transcendental reasoning. This isn't a direct deductive argument that's offered by many apologists like William Lane Craig or some of the others. We'll review with the following examples once again. Because naturalists assume that nature is all that there is, everything's reducible to the laws of physics working on matter. But of course those very laws, concepts, and theories that naturalists appeal to in order to argue that all is matter are not themselves made of matter. They're immaterial, abstract concepts. Theories about laws and physical processes are not themselves physical processes. It's a non-physical theory about physical things. Many naturalists are empiricists, as we've heard this evening. You can only know things through the five senses. They believe the only way we can know things are through the five senses. So what do we do with that? It's self-defeating. To say that the only way I can know things through the five senses, you can't know that proposition through the five senses. Can you give that to me in a bucket? Can you hand it to me and drink it? Can you give that out to your friends? Can you give them the, the idea of senses and reasoning and the laws of logic? Can you, can you serve logic light at a party somewhere? Of course not. Because it's an immaterial, abstract entity. Can you measure logic? Can you verify the concept of empiricism? When the naturalist admits to the existence of immaterial things, what happens then? Well, it still doesn't help. On the naturalist program, if immaterial things do exist, they still can't affect the physical world because by definition, physics is a closed system. This is what I've seen in all of the secular philosophy textbooks that I've looked at. It's subject to non-physical intervention though. But how do impersonal, immaterial, abstract laws and concepts have content that we are obligated to uphold? You see, there is a moral obligation to be logical. But if there is no God and everything's sound and fury signifying nothing, why can't I go out and do the things that I want to do? Why can't I go out and be irrational? What morally obligates me to be rational? Where is the epistemic normativity? Where is the, uh, the, the obligation morally to be rational? You say, well, if you don't, you'll die. So what? That's irrelevant. That doesn't answer the question. See the problem? It's the fallacy of irrelevant thesis. It's appealing, saying, well, you have to have the laws of logic to survive. But my friends, that's not the question. The issue is, why do the logic, laws of logic hold in a universe that's only made of matter? In other words, where do we get ultimate oughts and shoulds from a universe that's without God? What about the reliability of your thoughts given naturalism and evolution? Charles Darwin said, again, with me, the hard doubt always arises whether the convictions of a man's mind, which has been developed from the minds of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. If everything is the result of time, chance, and natural processes, what basis do we have to trust in our thoughts? Okay, one thing that I want to bring up about their complaint about all the miracles in the Bible, that there are a lot of strange things that happen, but they use the same argument that Hume used. He's saying that miracles are impossible because they're miraculous. I mean, think about that. Miracles are impossible because they violate science. 
Well, that's what miracles are. <laughs> to say that miracles are impossible because they're miraculous is to beg the question. Okay, now one thing, we didn't touch on this tonight, but he said that we don't have to be logical. We don't have to follow absolute laws of logic in the debate tonight. Well, I'm going to give you a new proof that God exists. Here it is. The purple penguin weighs Friday, therefore the much. Therefore God exists. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> gentlemen, you have extra time. We'll save that extra 15 seconds for the audience. I think it's unfortunate. I... I I like what they're they're doing. I like this argument. I like the presuppositionalism. It reminds me of what I've read from the Greek philosophers. It's unfortunate that the Bible isn't coherent enough to express these ideas. It's unfortunate that the Bible is not a reliable guide to faith. It's unfortunate that the Bible doesn't clearly map out history. It's, for, it's unfortunate that they have to rely so much on sources outside of the Bible to make their point and not even talk about Scripture, which they says is their ultimate authority as Christians. Strange and unfortunate. We're not here debating atheism tonight. That's not the topic of the debate. We're not here trying to defend or disprove naturalism. That's not the topic of the debate. They said they're not here trying to defend a generic God because that's not the topic of the debate. What is the topic? Does the Christian God exist? And how do we know what the Christian God is like and what his plans are? According to most Protestant Christians that I know, and these fellows, I'm not sure if they believe all Christians are Christians, uh, but according to most Protestant Christians, we know what God is like from the Bible. And when we look at it and we see contradictions, if there is a law of non-contradiction, well, there's plenty of contradictions in the Bible, so the Bible doesn't reflect the laws of logic, which are supposed to, supposedly rooted in their God, so therefore the Bible is not of their God. Tonight we're debating the existence of the Christian God. We only know that God, what he's supposed to be like through Scripture. And they're not talking about Scripture because Scripture is unreliable and not coherent in its picture of God or morality or anything for that matter. Okay, uh, so presuppositionalism is different from science in a lot of ways. These guys have made claims that they have no proof of, and that's evident in the questions that we asked them and they did not answer. Reason or logic is just a system that humans use and have used for thousands of years to solve problems. If that system ceases to work tomorrow, then scientists will find a new system that works. Logic is definitely not perfect, and it's just a tool we use to understand the world. The law of non-contradiction that we've talked about already. The law of contradiction states that A is not A, right? So you can't be one thing and not be another. I'm sure there are people in this audience who believe that this building that we're in right now is not moving, right? Because it's grounded in the earth. But this building is also moving because the earth is moving around the sun. So there is one thing that is correct and one thing that is not correct. This is simple logic, but both of the things are actually correct. The law of non-contradiction has just been proven wrong. So what is right? Both of them are right. None of them are right. One is correct. You have to understand that logic, since it was invented by man, can be fallible, can be wrong. And they think that logic comes from God so that it cannot be wrong. But they have offered no proof of this. They have offered no proof that the Christian God exists, and they have offered no proof that their God exists. Logic is just something we use. Logic has changed from Plato to Aristotle to John Locke to Schopenhauer to Bull to Welton. It isn't empirical. They state that they know that God exists, but they can't make sense out of their worldview because they can't say that how does God exist how does this belief work? How does it accomplish anything? There's no proof or justification for their belief, just an assertion that because logic exists, there's a God behind that logic. But they can't offer a proof to this. It relies on incoherent, incoherent terms because God can't be defined in an incoherent sense. Any attempt to apply like traits like omnipotent, omnipresent, or ideas about the nature of God runs into being uh, contradictions of the internal, uh, internal way because God can't be all these things and then nothing at the same time. Anyone would expect a universe Two that minutes. would be defined by a, content, oh, by a God would be contingent on something would be, na would be magical. So if God is supernatural, then the world would be magical and wouldn't work. The laws of physics would fail to, would fail to work because, you know, if you try to measure something, uh, you know, something would pop in and mess up the measurement because it's magical instead of working by the physical traits of the world alone. The universe we live in is not magical, 
Therefore, there isn't supernatural that represents it. If logic and reason were universals that God has to follow, that is to say, if God were limited, then theism wouldn't matter at all because God's supposed to be unlimited. So, is logic part of God's character or not? Supernatural is, to be, is defined as being beyond nature. It's not as defined as being not nature. So either God is natural or he's supernatural. He can't be both. You can't say something is beyond nature and that it has nature because beyond being beyond nature doesn't have any attributes that make it a positive being. This is basics of logic. Also, uh, the last point I want to make is, is it's it's a very odd notion to say that logic can be a sor- can be a part of something's character because you define God as having logic, but when you describe when you talk about logic in the philosophical sense, logic is not defined as a person is logical, person A is logical, is defined as an argument is logical or this is logical. So it's very odd to define a characteristic of a being as being logical instead of just saying that this argument is sound. This argument is not sound. And doesn't work with the way that that, that logic and philosophy works in the world. Uh, that's pretty much all I, all I got. Thank you for dropping early again. Thank you, audience. You have done a wonderful job, with just one exception. <laughs> be sure to point that out. Uh, we are running ahead of schedule, so we will extend to occupy all of the time necessary until 9 p.m. for question and answers. We will take a 10-minute break. Before you leave for the break, if you would, during the break, submit your questions that will be uh, placed up here in this basket, or I'll take them for you. We will screen those and ask as many questions as possible. Please be sure that those are can be read in 30 seconds or less. You have a 10-minute break beginning now. Okay, we have a summation, two six-minute sessions for summation. The affirmative goes first and six minutes begins now. Cornelius Van Til in his essay, Why I Believe in God, told the story of the Valley of the Blind. It goes something like this. A young man was out hunting, fell over into a cliff into the Valley of the Blind. There was no escape. The blind man did not understand him when he spoke of seeing the sun and the colors of the rainbow. But a fine young lady did understand him when he spoke the language of love. The father of the girl would not consent to the marriage of his daughter to a lunatic who spoke so often of things that did not exist. But the great psychologist of the Blind Man University offered to cure him of his lunacy by sewing shut his eyelids. Then they assured him he would be normal like everybody else. But the simple seer went on protesting that he did see the sun. The same can be said here tonight. Dust and I are proclaiming that we see God in every facet of life. We are proclaiming that one cannot make intelligible even one thought without first assuming that God exists. Now I had the opportunity to go out on campus with Dustin on Tuesday to do some open air preaching. Now folks, I'm telling you that is not easy to do. In my human weakness, I want to be liked by people. I don't want people to think I'm a freak or to associate me with many of the freaks that do walk around on campus. And trust me, they're there. <laughs> so why do I do this? I take to heart the words of people like Charles Spurgeon who said, if sinners be damned, let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. Now we may look crazy out there on campus, or perhaps even some of you think we look crazy up here. Our opponents would seek to cure our alleged lunacy by sewing shut our eyes. The thing is they assume that everything that we profess, yet are blinded to their own assumptions. Tonight they made knowledge claims, truth claims, logical claims, scientific claims, and moral claims, just as we said they would, but they can't account for any of them according to their worldview. C.S. Lewis said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun is risen, not only because I see it, but, but because by it I see everything else. When you start with God, you can make sense of the world. Without him, you can't make sense of anything. Many people here have the make, mistaken assumption that salvation is only for the next world, to save us from an eternity in hell. Well, that's a wonderful aspect of salvation. It's not the only one. Among others, is to save our reasoning now. You heard tonight what a worldview without God sounds like. I hope and pray and urge our opponents and any of you who deny the God that you know exists to repent of that denial and turn to seek the truth. 
God does not send people to hell for denying what they don't know. Open your eyes, folks. Don't let them or anyone else sew them shut. My friends, you can fight the gospel with every bone in your body. But as long as you continue to claim that truth exists, the gospel will prevail. As long as you insist that there is truth, we'll just take you at your own word and watch you collide with the truth the same way that a mother fights with her own unruly child. You want to beat them as hard as you can, but at the same time, you want pieces of them to survive the fight because their truth is your own. Listen to what one atheist said about our apologetic method. He says, quote, I've read paper upon paper on how to defeat a presuppositionalist in debate, and each time I see one of those methods used, I've also seen them fail. So listen closely, because I'm about to tell you how to beat them. Cut their feet off. Of course, you will only be able to do this by admitting and remembering that you also have no feet. Show them that there is no logos and no truth, and they too will have nothing to stand on. But this is a self-sacrificial mission. Your own flawed philosophy, based off your own hopes and desires instead of your honesty and rigor, will die too. That is the trade-off. If you decide not to and go about fighting them your own way, you'll only lend them time and practice to get stronger. Here's what he's saying. If you want to get rid of Christianity, stop saying that any truth exists whatsoever to argue for in the first place. But when you admit this, be aware that you'll also refute yourself because you won't even be able to argue that it's true that there's no such thing as truth. Oh, and by the way, you won't even really be able to know that either. Our atheist friends tonight have done the Greensboro community a great service by participating in this debate because it confirms what I've been saying for years. If you want to be logically consistent, there's only one existing worldview you can adhere to in the end, biblical Christian theism. If you opt for skepticism, you're still inconsistent because you're not skeptical about your skepticism. And I'll gladly hang my hat with the former versus the latter. It's a wicked thing to deny the one true God. When unrepentant sinners continually violate Christ's law by nature and by choice, they merit God's justice for themselves, a justice that will surely land them a place in hell. This is why you must turn from your sins and embrace Christ as Lord and Savior. He came not only to provide life for the hereafter, but also in the here and now. It's only through Christ that we find pardon for the crimes that we've committed against our Creator, and it's only through Him that a person can have peace with God. The only alternative for the unrepentant person is that you will get what you deserve. My friends, if you reject Christ and choose to take the broad path that leads to destruction, know this, the only thing you can do is stay alive as long as you can. Don't stop breathing because this is the best it's going to get for you. But remember this, mark my words, as you make that choice to reject Christ, remember this, your appointed time of death is not in your hands, but it's in His. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for finishing early, gentlemen. Your mm -hmm. summation in six minutes. That begins now. I'd like to begin our summation by thanking uh, the Christians for coming here. I think it's really important to talk about what we believe and why we believe it. Um, UNCG atheists would like to encourage Muslim groups to also participate in discussions and debates and other Christian groups that have different uh, perspectives on the faith. And I, I honestly appreciate it. My time as a Christian and my path provided a lot of benefits to me that I mentioned before. It helped develop my compassion and empathy. It helped develop my love of study. And it was these positive qualities that led me, as I said before, to ultimately reject the Christian faith. And, and as again, as I said earlier, we are not here, we were not here to argue about atheism or naturalism. The topic of the debate is, does the Christian God exist? And as our opponents discussed, their ultimate authority for what they know or believe they know about God and his plans and his purposes is what? It's the the Bible, the Christian scripture. And when I look at the Bible, I find it a wholly unreliable source. Now, uh, on Sai's website, he says, Christians account for universal and material unchanging laws as they reflect the very nature of God. Laws of logic, mathematics, science, and morality reflect the thinking and character of God. Well, let's assume that's true. What are we to make of all the illogical and contradictory things we find in scripture? 
if logic is rooted in God, and the law of non-contradiction is rooted in God, then the Bible should be non-contradictory. But it's full of contradictions. I listed some of them. Here's another one. David takes a sense of his census of his people. Who told him to do it? Was it God, according to 2 Samuel 24? Or was it Satan, according to 1 Chronicles? That's a big difference in who motivated David to take the census. And 2 Samuel 24, 1 Chronicles 21. David was punished for this, according to the scriptures. There are contradictions in scriptures. There's violations of history. There's violations of science. So if they're right with their presuppositions that science and morality and logic all have to be grounded in some sort of metaphysical reality, then it seems much more likely to me that it's some sort of impersonal force rather than the God of the Bible. But I have no reason to believe in the impersonal force either, but that's a completely different debate because tonight we're debating the existence of a Christian God and as all Christians, are, well, most Christians believe that the way we know God is through Scripture. The way they could prove to me that the Christian God exists is to just demonstrate, just demonstrate that the Bible, which is our God, is a reliable witness. Simple enough. Did they talk about the Bible tonight? Did they validate it as a historical witness? Did they talk about the problem of suffering? Did they talk about how the, the idea of an all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-perfect God is somehow logically reconcilable with the experience of overwhelming and gratuitous suffering in this world. When I was a Christian, I went to Haiti to do missions work. And I remember sitting in the missionary's compound and hearing children screaming for food. Children starving to death, just miles from me, less than. What sort of God allows that? The Christian God, according to scripture, has no problem intervening in the affairs of men, when it suits his purposes, when he thinks it's going to bring him glory. He has no problem killing all the firstborn sons of Egypt in order to free the slaves. But what does he do for the children who are dying every day? What does he do for the people who have AIDS? What is, I guess it's not in his interest to heal people today. I guess it's not in his interest to do anything miraculous today. I guess that he only liked to perform his magic tricks and violations of nature before we had modern science. That to me sounds way too convenient and very unlikely, and hence I do not believe in the Christian God. And they have given me no reason why I should believe in anything other than a generic God. Uh, today, accurate and objective information is readily available, and there's no excuse for believing in myths that were so prevalent many thousands of years ago. The other side tonight has made claims as to which there is no proof. Uh, they, they deny the, the simple thing made by Decretes, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, the basis of all of Western philosophy. Yet they could come up with no idea to refute uh, Kierkegaard's argument or uh, alternate point to this idea. There is no reason to believe the Bible. The Bible is ridiculous. It has dragons, God commanding bears to kill children, treating women as the property of man, allowing slavery, giving laws for what, how you should treat slaves, commanding sexism. The Bible has unicorns, talking of animals and other folklore. I choose my reason and logic to say all these things are false. In short, this is the only life that humans have ever had, and the prayers of religion to say, and for the purveyors of religion to say otherwise, is blatant deceit and to deny humans like us to live a happy and self-fulfilling life. I think this is wrong and it's just immoral. Thank you. All right, thank you gentlemen for finishing early. We are going to spend some additional time working through these questions. There have been a number of great questions, so we will start uh, with the affirmative. So are you ready for the first one? Okay. To the Christians, how can a God save only one fifth of the world's population and send the other for four fifths or other four fifths to an eternal hell? Is the belief in a Christian God a form of mass tribalism against another mass tribe? Well, since logic doesn't always hold, ice cream has bones, the purple penguin says much, therefore God exists. That's my answer. 
How does the atheist account for or explain love? We are a, we are a species that dev, uh, evolved with uh, important social interde interdependencies. Um, we love people because they add value to our lives. I think that's as simple as that. I would ask how you define love as well, because do uh, the emperor penguins love each other, even though they stay together for their for their entire lives? Do do other species of animals love each other? How do you define love as according to species? You stated the Bible contains poetic language. That suggests that it's open to multiple interpretations. So why should anyone value your interpretations and can and no one else? Well, since this answer doesn't have to be logical, my aunt, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you understand what it's like if you deny logic. See, the thing is, I'm not going to live up to their worldview and deny logic. I'm going to assume that our worldview is, is true and give a logical answer. But if I were to be consistent with their worldview, I wouldn't have to. I want you people to keep in mind when I give an answer like that. Another thing is, because there are no, uh, because people have varied interpretations, doesn't mean that there isn't one right interpretation. That's a hasty generalization. To say that there are many interpretations, so there can't be a right one, is incorrect. If people want to know how to properly interpret the Bible, then you come to our Bible study and we go through it. And we logically discuss the things that we talk about. That's how we, we interpret the Bible with the Bible to find out the right translation. Just like if you're in a car and you, and, and you don't hear your radio station properly, you don't say, well, I guess there's something wrong with the station. No, there's something wrong with our transmission, with, with our uh, receiving of that signal. And that's when we get together and we discuss what was said. Sure, there are different uh, interpretations, but that does not mean that there's not a right one. What do you hope for in life? Do you strive to be good in the same way and to help others? And if you do, why? I think that, uh, that my... The, the, my idea of what I want to be in life is to become a, a medical doctor. So I'm pursuing that in the uh, degree to get biochemistry. I think that this is, that this will help humans out more than anything else that I can do in my life. To, to heal the sick, to, to help people in any kind of specific way is better than to just ignore the problems or to be something like uh, you know, another specific major that would not uh, help humanity. I find value and meaning in life by finding things that are personally fulfilling to me, which I think is what everyone does, no matter what they label it. I like to help people uh, and work towards uh, mitigating suffering in the world because I know that in my own personal experiences, I also don't like to suffer. I also don't like it when people don't uh, give reasons for why I should do things. I don't like other people ruling over me. I wouldn't want to live in Tehran. I wouldn't want to live in North Korea. I like to have my own voice and to shape my own life. There's a good question though, why do Christians, why do Christians love their neighbor? Do they do it because there is something valuable about their neighbor? Something respectful, something dignified in another human being? Or do they only do it because God commands? And yet when God commands them to kill their son, they have to do that too because there is no such thing as morality in Christianity. There is only the edict of God and whatever God says is what is just. And so if God says slavery needs to happen, slavery is justified back then. And when God says that you can rape a woman and then kill her, that's okay for back then. It may not be okay today because there is no such thing as morality with a Christian God. There is only God's law. So when God says kill somebody, it's okay. When God says don't kill anybody, it's not okay. That is the morality of the Taliban, and that is the morality of the Bible, unfortunately. That is not our morality. But why not? <laughs> On the topic of morality, the first couple Ten Commandments have nothing to do with morality. They have to do with God being jealous, or the only one. So are the Ten Commandments really moral? Yes, moral? the Ten Commandments are an exhibition of God's nature and character. We do not determine uh, what is moral just simply because God has commanded it. We determine what's moral because what God commands proceeds from His nature. Therefore, Eudifro's dilemma doesn't apply to the Christian God. It may apply to a deistic God. When we look at the Ten Commandments, we see that the first four, the first four commandments found in the first table of the law are directed in insofar as how we are to act toward God. The last uh, half of the Ten Commandments refer to how we are to operate in accordance with our neighbor. If atheism is true and we're all just molecules banging around and everything's a result of time, chance, and natural processes, then why should I care about this particular part of the evolutionary chain? 
Why should I see an individual that has dignity over and above another individual? Why shouldn't I eat my neighbors instead of love them? That's the question that's at hand, folks. If logic and reason cease to exist tomorrow, then with what will we find new logic and reasoning? We find new logic and reasoning in what works in society. Uh, if something I think, does... I think you missed it. Okay. If logic and reason cease to exist tomorrow, so that presumes that beginning on uh, Sunday, or uh, let's see, Saturday, <laughs> if logic and reason cease Friday. to exist tomorrow, you can tell I'm working at my capacity. If logic and reason cease to exist tomorrow, that would mean on Saturday. Friday. 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 Tomorrow is Friday. Wait, Today is Thursday. Wait, on Friday, with what will we find new logic and reasoning? With what will we find new logic and reasoning? <laughs> well, what, what does it mean for reason to stop existing? Can you, if you could explain that, you would have to give me reasons to do that. And we base our reasons based on the, the best evidence that we have in front of us. The reason why I reject Christianity is because I don't find there are good reasons to believe in the Christian God. So if you could give me a picture of a world that doesn't have reason and explain what that would look like, maybe I could answer that question. If they could give me a picture of their God that is based on reason, I might be able to accept their God too, but unfortunately their God is based on the Christian scripture, which is unreasonable, contradictory, and violates what we believe we know of science based on our best science today, uh, and so on. If you say two plus two equals four, is an example of the type of science, isn't this type of example of science and mathematics that are based in the Bible, why does the Bible seem to be so bad at math and science? Example, <laughs> Leviticus uh, 11, 20 to 23, it says insects have four legs. You know, that, that's one of the things that we got to get back to. Is that, you know, when Dustin said that this is not an argument about facts, it's about how we interpret the facts based on what we already believe. We start with the position that the Bible is inerrant. So if there's something that seems contradictory, contradict, we look at the languages and we try to figure it out. We sit down and we study it. But the question is, which world do you can account for the problem of contradictions? I asked them why are contradictions not allowed, they can't tell us. And the thing is, they said logic could change. Now people's perception of logic has changed over time, but if logic can change, why can't there be a four-legged insect tomorrow? Why couldn't there be a four-legged insect then? The thing is, we'll study the scriptures and we'll try and find out, we'll try and see how we can reconcile that, but if you don't start with the presupposition that the, logic, that the Bible is infallible, you can't have logic. You can have no complaints against the Bible. They're borrowing logic from our worldview to argue against our worldview. Now the thing is, they say that you know logic can change. Well, maybe maybe back then you know insects had four legs. They can't have a problem with that. They can't say, well, that's illogical. Well, how do you know logic hasn't changed? So you have to keep in mind that when they argue like that, they're borrowing from our worldview. Sure, there's things that we might never know, or, or might not find out till you know how they're reconciled. But we trust that they can be reconciled because if you don't, your worldview is reduced to absurdity. Well, another thing, too, is the, the questioner quotes Leviticus 11, 22, and 23, but actually they got the question wrong. It says, These of them you may eat, the locust and its kinds, and the devastating locust and its kinds, and the cricket and its kinds, and the grasshopper and its kinds, but all other winged insects which are four-footed are detestable to you. It's making a distinction between different types of insects. It's not saying that all insects are four-footed. So the question's flawed. The thing is, Dustin, Dustin has a book. Just one second. Dustin has a book with him. Hang on a second. Dustin has a book with him that resolves contradictions that these people bring up. If you look on the internet, you can find them. But that's not the question. The question is not whether they can be resolved. It's what's the problem with contradictions in the atheistic universe. And I'm telling you, if there aren't absolute laws, you can have, a, you can have no problems with contradictions. But they obviously do, because they're depending on absolute laws of logic, which they can't account for. Think about that, please. All right. How do fossils prove that there was no Adam and Eve? Um. <laughs> I, I don't know where to start with this one. I mean, like, <laughs> uh, fossils prove that, that things in, in the evolutionary standpoint evolved from a specific thing about three to four billion years ago. And that thing continued to evolve over time. Uh, <laughs> there, there, okay, so there was no Adam and Eve because there was no first human. Humans evolved 
from Australopithecus. If you want to, like, you want to break it down to anthropological standpoints. I mean, that's the only answer you can give. Like, so, so what in the gradual evolution of Homo sapiens sapiens? At which point would we pinpoint and say, oh, oh, this couple, that's Adam and Eve. Uh, Neanderthals, does uh, the atonement of Christ cover them? Does it, does it cover Artipithecus? Uh, the, the fossil record evolution shows that humanity didn't just poof appear fully formed with all our cognitive capabilities and what we are now. We gradually change over time. Our species is still changing. Every species is still changing. Why is the absolute truth of morality necessary? Why must logic be absolute to be useful? Because to say that logic is not absolute means I can cont contradict you from this point forward like I did in my answer with my first question. I could just, just say a bunch of gobbledygook and it wouldn't make any difference. Look, if the laws of logic do not hold in all times, throughout all places, for all people, everywhere, then all types of absurdity and nonsense result. That's why the laws of logic must be absolute. And to say that, to say that the laws of logic cannot be absolute is to make an absolute truth claim. In order to deny the laws of logic being absolute, you have to affirm them in order to deny them. I debated a, uh, an atheist on uh, British radio three weeks ago, and he had the same problem with me. He said, you know, I can believe that there's a law of non-contradiction, but I can't believe that there's an absolute law of non-contradiction. They are not the same. You know what I said to him? Oh, so you believe they're the same. He said, no, they're not the same. I said, oh, so you believe they're the same. He says, no. I contradicted him, and he had a problem with that because he believes in the absolute law of non-contradiction. Now, if you want to hear that debate, if you want to hear that debate, you can go to my website and navigate to the multimedia page, and there's a link to it, but in order to get to that page, you have to get all the questions right, and I think only half the room might do that. <laughs> okay. Would you agree that most people believe in the Christian God because they are scared to accept that some things are irrational and therefore push all rationality towards something that can beg no questions. In my opinion, I think most people who believe in Christianity believe because of the accident of geography. Uh, if you're born in Brazil, most likely you're going to be Catholic. Catholic. If you're born in Saudi Arabia, most almost 99.9 percent you're gonna be a Muslim if you're born in the south in the United States it's not a it's not a law but overwhelmingly most likely you're going to be a Christian when I had this deeply emotional experience I didn't see a cross there wasn't a burning bush there wasn't anything tangible that said this experience is Christian no I I translated my experience that I have which was deeply emotional and important to me I translated it according to the culture and religious tradition that I was familiar with that's what most people do. So I believe most people are Christians because of the accident of geography, where they're born. And to me, that poses a problem for God. So how do you explain the explosion in Asia? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> No. Okay, go ahead. Can you demonstrate, without using the Bible, that, that we should believe in the superiority of faith over, over reason? Yes. Romans chapter 1 without says... Without the Bible. I'm sorry. Go without ahead. the Bible. Can you demonstrate without using biblical passages? Yes, and yes, exactly. Thank you. Romans chapter 1. <laughs> <laughs> the law of non contradiction. Yeah, <laughs> wow. Romans chapter 1, verse 10. Am I going to get to answer the question tonight or not? Romans chapter 1 tells us that apart from the Bible, apart from special revelation found in the Bible, all men know God exists. This is exactly what you see throughout all human people throughout the world. People worship something. They worship totem poles and rocks and Allah, and some of them worship anything you can imagine. Creatures, multiple gods, they make gods in their own image. People are created to worship. Tigers don't worship. Chimps don't worship. Why do people worship? They worship because they're created to do that. You have natural revelation. People are going to have a basic innate knowledge of God that's hardwired within them. God tells us that He's done that. But people don't need to have the Bible to know that that's true. All you have to do is look at the history of mankind and you will see that we are a worshiping species. Okay, let me... Let me okay, I just want to add a little bit to that answer. Now the Bible is our ultimate authority. So we have to appeal to Scripture because there's nothing higher than it. But listen to if I turn the question on to them. Their ability to reason is their ultimate authority. Listen to that question turned to the atheist. 
tell me how your reasoning is valid, but don't use your reasoning. <laughs> Does that make any sense to you? And that's what they're asking us to do. Okay, so just pay close attention when they make those kind of objections. I mean, if you turn them around, then you see the absurdity. God can reveal to us, as they have admitted, that scripture is true. How do they know that reasoning is valid? They reasoned it. That's viciously circular. Our argument will admit it's circular, but we have an escape from that circularity in that we have a God who can reveal things to us such that we can know them for certain as they admitted. How do they have certainty? They can't. All right, thank you. What is your ultimate authority for knowing anything at all? Yourself? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, as the argument that I pointed out earlier that Kierkegaard stated from the original Cogito Ergo Sum, X thinks, I am that X, I think, therefore I am. There, there is nothing beyond that. We've asked them for a proof, that, we've asked the other side for a proof that their God exists over other gods, but they have not given one. Why is their God valid over the God of Allah, uh, uh, Ganesh? You can name a, a thousand gods and they can't give a proof that the Christian God is valid. We've asked it several times tonight and no proof has been given because you can't give a proof. But there are proofs that we can say that our ability to reason, our ability to think is not absolute because we don't believe in absolute reason. However, we believe that there is a reason that humans can attest to. We use reason, right? We're basing our arguments on reason, on evidence. and. I don't want to belittle them because I believe that they also base their experiences on reason and evidence. So if someone today claims uh, that God commanded them to kill their son, they would demand evidence for that. If someone today claimed that their long hair gave them superhuman power, they would probably demand evidence for that. I'm assuming, I'm hoping. So we all use reason. They're adding one extra step there to say that the Bible is their authority to guide and suppress their reason. And all I'm asking again and again is to give me good reason why I should believe that the Bible is a reliable guide. That's all I'm asking. I've said it again and again. I've also talked about the problem of suffering. And I know they have an answer to this. And I would like them to share it if, if they want at some point. But the problem of suffering, that to me presents a problem of contradiction in the, the, the nature of God as Christians understand it. Where do dinosaurs exist in the Bible? Job chapter 40 talks about Behemoth. It says that he has uh, legs that are like uh, those that are made like bars of iron. He has a tail like a cedar tree. The Bible tells us that God made everything in the space of six days, approximately 6,000 years ago. You cannot fit millions of years into Scripture. If you're here tonight and you're a Christian, it does not work. The Bible mentions that there are dinosaur-like creatures that are in Job, chapter 40 and 41. The Bible tells us of the Tanaim in Genesis chapter 1. That's a Hebrew word translated as great sea monsters. It tells us on day 6 that He made the great land-dwelling animals along with man. That means that humans and dinos existed together. That's the logical conclusion. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Okay, we need to, we've got several more questions. Please, uh, you all will help us move forward. If we, along with Kierkegaard, arbitrarily assert our own existence, how does that help us logically? Is not that akin to simply asserting an opinion and hoping that no one notices? Uh, Kierkegaard states that the, the statement that I uh, had earlier removes yourself from logic. If you're going to use logical presuppositions, like our, our opponents are doing tonight, they they are not actually providing an they they providing no assertion that their worldview is correct. They're just saying you have to believe in God. There is no example. There is no reason to believe in God. They're just saying you have to believe in God for our logic to work. Why? There's no reason. Uh, you just have to accept it. That's that that's not that's not an argument. That's just an assertion. It doesn't work. The idea of Kierkegaard and Decretes of I think, therefore I am, the whole basis for our philosophy, for the way that we live our, the way that we live our lives, works in the way we live our lives. Because as much as we can observe as human beings, works for us. And that's how, that's how we observe and view our world. I think the problem of knowing our own existence is an interesting philosophical problem. 
that they're exploring that many philosophers have explored. And I, and I know I keep driving this home, but you notice they're not quoting scripture to explain how we know that we're real. They're, they're quoting philosophy that sounds much more like the Greeks that came hundreds of years before Jesus. Why? Because the Bible is unreliable. It's unclear. It doesn't provide us with a framework for understanding our world. It's insufficient for understanding nature, whether in science or morality or our existence in philosophy. We have to supplement it with all these other ways of trying to make it make sense, like this book that's chock full of all the apparent contradictions and inconsistencies and historical inaccuracies. How can we make these squares fit in the circle? Well, we'll do everything we can do because we believe in God. Are you able to address the opening statements made by the atheists about the non-reliability of the Bible's textual basis, the existence of Jesus, the talking snake, the donkey, people living to be hundreds of years old? Yes. <laughs> I think they would follow, can you do that now? <laughs> no. How many people came here for a Bible study? Okay, well, I'll tell you what we can <laughs> We're not here for a Bible study. We We're can not. explain these things. We can, we can you know, explain all of these things. We can, we can sit down. We can discuss it. But that's not the point. Because we're going to give an explanation. They're going to say, well, that's ridiculous. They're going to say, that's ridiculous based on their presuppositions. The question isn't whether one of us can explain it or whether the other one can explain it according to their worldview. The question is, why don't they make sense in the atheist worldview? Keep that in mind. When they, they say that something is illogical, they're appealing to absolute laws of logic. Don't forget that. They say we don't have to be logical. I can give them an answer. The purple penguin weighs Friday, therefore the much. That's my answer, if we can be illogical, but we can't. They want us to be illogical because they believe in the God of Scripture who demands us to be logical. It says in Isaiah 1.18, come let us reason together. We're supposed to be logical. We have a reason to be logical. But do they know? They have no objection to Scripture. We can talk about that if you want to come to the Bible study. Fine, we'll talk about that, how we resolve that. But folks, that is not the issue here tonight. That's why we don't talk about it. One of the things that you'll hear is this idea that Jesus Christ was a myth. And it's the Christ myth theory. What they'll say is things like this. Addis was born of a virgin on December 25th, was crucified, dead, buried, resurrected. Krishna, born of a virgin with a star in the east to signal his birth, performed miracles, died, and was resurrected. Dionysus, born of a virgin on December 25th, performed miracles like turning water into wine, was referred to as the King of Kings and God's only begotten Son, died and was resurrected. Mithras, born of a virgin on December 25th, had 12 disciples, performed miracles, was dead for three days and resurrected, was known as the truth and the life, and was worshipped on Sunday. That's what you're going to hear in some of your world religion classes here. Listen to this. There is no record that Osiris rose bodily from the dead. Instead, he became the god of the netherworld. As one put it, Osiris is not a dying god, but a dead god, always depicted as deceased, a deceased mummified king. Now, his dead body, admittedly in that text, is laid in the tomb. If you want to call that a bodily resurrection, have at it. Horus was not born of a virgin, but, but was the son of Osiris and Isis, not married. Horus never dies, so he can have no resurrection. Neither the Bible nor Christianity claims that Jesus was born, at least original early Christianity claims that Jesus was born on December 25th, so parallels with ancient myths are inconsequential. <laughs> Mithra was not born of a virgin. He did not have 12 disciples. There is no textual evidence of his death, and there could be no resurrection. The Christ myth is just that. It's just a myth. I've got page after page after page that gives historical, archaeological evidence refuting every single one of those claims. The reason why we didn't address them tonight is because they're not going to accept the answer. They're going to read the answer through their presuppositions. All right, thank you. Well, hold on. One more thing. Shepherd's Fellowship broadcasts a live stream on the Lord's Day and on Wednesday nights at gracingthetriad.com. UNCG atheists meet. Thank you. UNCG atheists meet every Friday with the exception of this coming Friday. Uh, in the Phillips room. Thank you very much. Good night. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> Oh,
Syria. It's probably going to be called Blue 